Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting to you live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Torah Talk. This week, we are going to be covering Parsha Vayechi with Moray Ira Michelson. Shalom, shalom, brother Ira Michelson. How are you? It's so good to have you in the studio once again. Nice to have you. Um, your radio voice. <laughs> Absolutely. Ira Michelson coming to you from <laughs> studios in beautiful spot israel yes indeed yes indeed i feel kind of spoiled having you so much here uh, as far as the the timing i got you to uh, you, you basically like i've said before uh, and i've told many people you know you, you were the initiating factor that kind of spun off this whole knock talk so i got you there got you on uh, the first um parsha for for bereshit and now i'm getting you to close the door behind us to move on to uh, to our next book. So thank you so much again, uh, Ira, yeah. for coming in. This is great. My pleasure. And I think it's great that uh, I, I have that much sway over you that I even got you to change the time. So that <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. So, so that I don't have to be up at four o'clock in the morning. Oh, man. Oh, man. I know, right? Now, you know, I really did. It's, there was something, uh, there was just something about you when, I, when we first met. And when I talked to you the first time on Facebook, I was like, you know, I really like him. I like the way you, I like your, your teaching technique. You know, you, in my opinion, you've like got the total package. You've got the voice for it. You've got the, the demeanor. It all just sends, it, it just tends to just make my brain tick perfectly. I like that. So that's, that's pretty cool. You know, it, it's, it's amazing to me. My wife and I were talking about this. Um, you know, I mean, you, you have, blessed us incredibly with some of the things that you've said about us, about me, you know, when I came out to your place, but it's amazing. And it's not just me. I talk to other teachers as well. You know, some of the other rabbis that I'm in relationship with and, and we're amazed because it, it just the number of people that we get to meet, you know, now that there are people coming to Israel on different tours and I get to go out and meet them and people that come up to me that I don't even really know. Um, you know, some people I know from Facebook, other people I really don't even know. I don't recognize the names and people will come over and say things like, if it wasn't for you, I don't know where I'd be. Um, it's just, it's just part of this, uh, amazing thing that's taking place. This, um, you know, what I like to call a paradigm shift mm -hmm. that's taking place. And really the, the, the last few parshiot. Um, that we've been reading in the Torah, Vayigash, Vayichi, that we're, we're going to be handling uh, this afternoon, this afternoon for you, tonight for me, uh, really speaks to this, mm -hmm. of what's going on. And I think, you know, we should probably touch on that a little bit today um, when we go over this Parsha. But it, it just really is phenomenal what's going on. Um, most of us have a past. Uh, we have a present and we have a future. And the, the past is behind us. Um, but if you would have asked many of us 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, would we find ourselves where we are today? Um, we would have just looked at each other like we were crazy. <laughs> if we would never think that we would be in this. You and I would never think that at some point we would be sitting here, me in Israel, you in Texas, um, you know, on the air broadcasting live, um, doing uh, Torah for the nations, and not just for the nations, but a very diverse group of both Jewish people and non-Jewish people that just love God, love his Torah, and, and want to have a right relationship with him that doesn't include idolatry. Indeed. Indeed. And that's uh, it's, a friend of mine had uh, made a, sent me a text the other day. He said, you realize... And this is his comment, and I, and I guess there's truth to it, but it just I never looked at it that way. And he said, "You realize, William? He says you've 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 basically got one of the larger yeshiva <laughs> things set up because of the accessibility from just any click from anywhere in the world. You can just click and tune in to Torah teachings, you know. And sure. uh, I said, I'm, I'm very I'm very humbled to be a part of it, and that's really it. I'm just a part of it, you know. And it's like um, uh, the biggest part of it, though, uh, is it's the teachers is you and is all the other rabbis who are spending their time uh, giving us this information that, that we so long to learn. So it's true. And you know what the beauty of this is? The beauty of this is that when we're talking about Torah, 
um, and, and we're disseminating the, the beauty of Torah. There's no competition here. It's right, not about, right. oh, you know, he has this show and this one has that show and this one's famous and that guy's known. And, you know, uh, you know, look, we're all just regular people. It's like when you meet, you know, some of my friends, Rabbi Michael Skoback, Rabbi Tovia Singer, who are personal friends of mine. I mean, I know people are sometimes in awe of these men, but these are very humble, mm -hmm. just regular guys, you know, that just happen to be people that love God, love the Torah, and want to disseminate this information. And and it's not about who, it's about getting it out. It do, you know, it doesn't matter. I know you've had Rabbi Katz on several times. Rabbi Katz is my chavrusa, for people that don't know what that is. It's, he's my learning partner. He literally lives right across the street from me. I can go out on my, outside my door, outside of my Merpeset and yell across the street, you know, to his window. You know, <laughs> my, my Merpeset, my patio looks straight into his window of his house. That's and, awesome. and, and the beauty, the beauty of it is, is that we talk about this all the time. It's not about us. Mm -hmm. so we don't care about getting accolades. We don't care about, um, uh, people thinking, oh, Rabbi Katz is this, or Ira Michelson is that. It's all about getting the Torah out. It's all about getting the information out. Why? Because it brings Gula and it brings Mashiach. And this is what the, this Parsha is about. This is what Yaakov Avinu, in many ways, in a very spiritual sense, in Vayechi, is getting across to his sons when he gathers his sons together, is speaking to them about Gula and Mashiach. Everything that we talk about as it relates to Torah today and what's going on with the people that are coming out of idolatry comes down to Geula and Mashiach. Mm -hmm. I have a friend of mine in Yerushalayim, Chaim David, Eric Targan. He's a great uh, Kabbalistic teacher. Uh, and when he comes to Tzfat, I always get together with him. And, and we talk about this. And he says, Hashem is going to bring Gula. Okay? He's going to bring redemption. I'm sorry. I have to remember to give translation of this. Geula or Gula. Uh, redemption. God is going to bring it. The question is how he's going to bring it. He can bring Gula sweetly, but it doesn't have to be sweetly. If Gula is going to come sweetly, who do you think it depends on, William? Mm. It depends on you and me, mm. and right. it depends on everybody else out there listening that loves Hashem and loves his Torah. We have the ability to bring the gula sweetly. Very good. Well, Ira, uh, before we get kicked off completely, uh, if you want to, why don't you touch base uh, for everybody who maybe who hasn't uh, followed along uh, with last week, just kind of to give a, a quick summary on what happened last week and where we're at now. And then maybe uh, when we close out, go ahead and just give a little uh, teaser as to what next week holds for the viewer. As far as the Parsha goes? Yes, sir, as far as the Parsha goes. You know, I mean, you, you're going to have to forgive me. Uh, you know, I just um, um, actually today, actually right now at this very moment, four weeks ago, I was just coming out of recovery into the hospital, <laughs> the hospital bed. Um, I just got into the room at about 11 p.m., 11.30. It's 11.25 here in Israel. Um, and I was just being wheeled in. So I'm actually four weeks post-surgery. So I've tried to stay on top of the Torah as much as I could. You know, obviously, Vayigash is Yehuda um, coming before Yosef, his brother. Um, there's the reconciliation that takes place um, between Yosef and his brothers in Mitzrayim, um, and uh, which is, you know, it, in and of itself is an amazing, amazing Torah portion, um, which in essence at the same time brings in... Um, Unfortunately, this beautiful time of Yaakov now having this time with his son, having this reunion with his son, but at the same time bringing um, Yaakov and his family into Mitzrayim, which eventually, you know, turns out to be not such a good thing, leading into Parsha Shemot, which we get into next week, in the idea of a, uh, you know, while we have Yosef now, uh, basically a ruler in Mitzrayim, a viceroy, uh, you know, in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, um, really almost a second in command in Egypt. Um, what happens is we read in Parsha Shemot next week that a pharaoh arises that doesn't know. He doesn't know mm -hmm. Yosef. He doesn't know these people. And suddenly what we see is here we're seeing the beginnings of Geula in Parsha's Vayechi, but something has to happen 
um, for this gula to take place. And sometimes, we're going to see this in Parshas Vayechi as well, that sometimes what has to happen um, is, uh, you know, maybe what we should do is just get into it a little Sounds bit. Sounds good. Sounds good. Go and right ahead. And explain what I'm talking about. Very good. Okay. Because so, it really comes into the first couple of verses in uh, Parshas Vayechi. Um and I believe we start off in Bracious in Genesis chapter 47, verse 28, is where it starts. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read the first verse here in Hebrew and then uh, translate it into English. Okay. And, and, and we'll get into it if it's okay. Sounds great. Sounds great. Go right ahead. It says, Vayechi Yaakov be'eretz Mitzrayim sheva esre shana. Vayihi Yeme Yaakov, Shine Chayav, Sheva Shanim, Vaarbaim Umaat Shana. And basically, what this says is, and Yaakov lived in the land of Mitzrayim 17 years. So the days of Yaakov, the years of his life, were 147 years. Okay, so it's kind of, it's very interesting when we look at the Torah. Um, and of course, other teachers bring this up as well. And when you see the wording sometimes in these verses, sometimes there's almost like a redundancy. You know, we see things like, oh, so these are the days he lived 17 years, so the days of Jacob, the years of his life were 147 years. Why do we see that? The days of Jacob, the years of his life, it almost seems like we have redundant language. Um, so we really have to look at it. We have to say to ourselves, what, you know, what is Hashem really trying to say to us? And what is he trying to, you know, what are the nuggets that we pull out of this? What is he really trying to explain to us about Yaakov and about his life? We know that there was this period of, of, of Yaakov's life, obviously, where he was separated from his most beloved son. You know, we know this, that, that Yosef was, you know, the, the guy. You know, this was the son he loved, the son of, you know, his beloved wife. Uh, and we know that there was this 22-year period that he was separated from his son. Uh, so, so we see here, not only with Yaakov, but just with people in general, that, that at the end of a person's life, um, it's often seen as the measure of his entire life. You know, we, we talk about that. You always hear stories about, you know, a life flashing before somebody's eyes when they're, you know, when they're on their deathbed. Um, but it's really true, and it's very true here in, in the story of Yaakov. It was the last 17 years of his life that Yaakov actually lived. This is, this is what we're learning from this when it specifically points out this, this period uh, of time, you know, the 17 years that's focused on that he lived in Mitzrayim because he was reunited with Yosef, as we said. And... Uh, in another perspective that's taught by the Malbim, the Malbim is one of our great um, uh, commentators in Judaism. His name was Meir Leibish ben Yechiel Mechel Wisser. Try to say that five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> that he says that a human being is only truly living when he's serving his creator. Okay? So think about that. You know, we see Yaakov when he comes before Pharaoh, he's like complaining about his life, you know, what a terrible life he led, you know, and here we're focusing on the 17 year period, but he had this 22 year period that he mourned for his son. And it's said that the divine inspiration was not upon him during this time. Okay. But now through the 17 years of joy, Yaakov achieved, um, a, a spiritual perfection, if you will, um, that rectified the years of the anguish that he felt before. Okay? So this is why it talks about this idea of living. And then still there's another pers perspective, is that it was not the 17 years of joy that take preeminence in his life, but it was the troubled years of his life, which he went through many, many tests, and it was this that allowed him to receive the elevated name of Yisrael rather than Yaakov, because we know that sometimes he's called Yaakov and sometimes he's called Yisrael. And we'll see this in, in other verses in our Parsha uh, today. Um, 
And, and this reminds me of my own life. And I, and I want to tell you a little story about this because I think it's very important that people get this point. Because sometimes what happens is we don't look at the things that we went through. And I'll make two points about this. Um, when I came out of Narishkite, when I came out of the nonsense that I was involved in for many years, and I made tshuva and returned to Judaism as an Orthodox Jew, I was very angry, William. I was very angry with Hashem. Okay, mm -hmm. I was a kid that grew up in Orthodox Judaism. I was getting ready to go into yeshiva. Um, you know, people think that I'm this great scholar. You know, but I look at it and I say to myself, what would have happened if I if I would have stayed the course? If I would have, you know, if I would have gone to yeshiva, gosh, where would I be today? You know, you know, 30, 40 years later studying uh, in yeshiva, learning, you know, uh, just just really getting into it. And I was very angry about that. And um, it took me quite some time. And it was really my friend, Rabbi Tovia Singer, that, um, that, that really gave me a, a different perspective on this. You know, what he said to me one day on the phone was, he says, Ira, he says, I envy you, my friend. And I said, Tovia, you envy me? What do you mean? You en How could you envy me? Look at what I went through you know, 20 years of nonsense. And he says to me, Ira, I've never been tested the way you've been tested. He says, I grew up an Orthodox Jew. My father was an Orthodox rabbi. I'm an Orthodox rabbi. I've known nothing else but this. He says, look at what you've done. Look at the test you've been through and look where you are now. This is very much what we're talking about, Yaakov Avinu. The, these, and, and if I think about it, it just dawned on me. That, that really, you know, not only do I talk about sometimes, you know, this hip replacement that I had and walking with a limp and identifying with Yaakov Avinu when he wrestled with the Malach, you know, and walked with a limp, but I'm thinking the 22 years really coincides with the, with the 22 years that I was in Narishkai. Mm. So I very much identify with this, and I want other people to identify with it as well. I want you to identify it with William. I want all of our listeners that are listening to us to identify with the trouble that you went through in your life, with those terrible things, with those trials and those tests, because you're very much like Yaakov Avinu. You're very much like our patriarchs. You're very much like the biblical characters that didn't just have these elevated times, but had these really times of terrible testing that made them the people that they are today. You and I wouldn't be who we are today, William, if we hadn't gone through what we went through. You wouldn't have Tanakh talk today. I wouldn't be viewed by people as some great teacher and being able to speak into people's lives and being able to bring them out of idolatry through the help of Hashem if I didn't go through what I went through. Right. That, that's, that's point number one. Point number two is this. About two years ago, my father, Alava Shalom, was nifter, um, passed away um, going on four years ago. Okay? And it dawned on me, I'm, I'm going to turn 59 in uh, about six weeks. Okay? So this was about two years ago, around the time that I was 57. And I was thinking about my dad. My dad was 87 when he passed away. Okay? And I, and I was sitting there thinking one day, William, that, wow, you know, I'm 57 years old. What have I really accomplished in my life? You know, what have I really done? And I know people come to me all the time and say, you know, what a great guy I am and how much I've affected them. But I looked at my life and I said, what have I really accomplished? What have I done with my life? And it struck me at that moment that if Hashem, in his mercy, would allow me to live as long as my father had lived. That at 57 years old, I had a choice to make. I could either look at the last 57 years, William, and say to myself, I've accomplished nothing or have, or have accomplished not what I wanted to accomplish in 57 years. Or I could look at the fact that with the mercy of Hashem, he might give me another 30 years. And gosh, what could I accomplish in the next 30 years? Indeed. And that's what I want people to get just in that first verse when we talk about the life of Yaakov 
and the years that he lived. You know, I think that's part of people ask me from time to time because they, uh, a lot of them have seen my testimony on on Tanak Talk and had listened to it on your show with uh, with you and Rod on uh, Light to the Nations. And um, I think I got into more detail uh, on the actual video that I that I had put up. Um, but a lot of people were kind of curious: how is it that a person could come out of such an abusive childhood? Uh, and so like estranged, uh, you know, treated as a foreigner within his own house for so long and not be bitter and not uh, have these issues still plaguing me today. And I think the secret is this story is a really good example of it. You know, um, everything Joseph knew that everything was happening for a reason. You know, the, the brothers, you know, they, they were just still thinking uh, in the flesh, but he was he was seeing things in the spirit the way it was. And seeing that everything does happen for a reason, if you really believe that, it will change the way you respond to things. And sure. when and when you change the way you respond to things, that changes the outcome as well. So and the, and your surroundings. And that's one thing I really love about this story the most. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with timing as well. You know, um, uh, you know, when we talk about Yosef, there's no question that that he had these visions, he had these dreams. But there's a matter of timing too. <laughs> you know, right. uh, you you could sit back and you can say, well, you know, is really is is this really a good time for me to go out to my brothers, and and tell them uh, what I just dreamed, or maybe <laughs> I should wait a little bit. Um, you know, sit back and 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 see what Hashem says further about this. Um, a, a lot of things have have to do with timing as well. Look, everything is part of Hashem's plan, and uh, Hashem wanted things to go the way He wanted them to go. But you know, we we can affect things as well too. The bottom line is, is that uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, there was this opportunity for reconciliation um, that could have gone very badly, and yet um, two people that were that represented malchus, that represented kingship. Um, really brought about uh, the beginning and really taught us a great lesson. When you think about it, Yehuda is the one through whom kingship comes and through whom Mashiach will come. Um, and here was Yosef, who was the viceroy of Egypt. So you had these two very stately, very uh, king, uh, you know, uh, leaders uh, coming together. If, if only that would happen in, in our day today. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, things things would be quite different in the world. Um, you know, moving forward, um, you know, in talking about this, something struck me in the Haftorah for this week as well, before we get back into Vayechi, um, because the Haftorah comes from um, a Malachim Aleph, uh, First Kings, Chapter 2. Um, and in the same way that Yaakov Avinu, um, is is kind of on his uh, last leg, so to speak. He's you know at the end of his life. He's you know kind of heading to his deathbed, so to speak. We see the same thing happen in First Kings two with David Amelach, uh, King David. It actually says, "Vayikhvu uh, yemei David lamut, vayitzav et Shlomo beno lemor." Now the days of uh, David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, Anochi holech bederch kol ha'aretz v'chazakta v'hayta li'ish. It's, it's really such a powerful verse. He says, Anochi holech, I go the way bederch kol ha'aretz of all the earth. In other words, he's basically, it's another way of saying, I go to sleep with my father's like we see so many other times the patriarchs talk about. Right. And right. then he says, V'chazakta, you be strong, V'hayta l'ish, and be a man. I love that. That's awesome. And be a man. Okay? And then it goes on, um, and I'll just read the English. Um, in the next verse, verse 3, it says, And keep the charge of Hashem your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances and his testimonies according to that which is written in the Torah of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and whatever you turn, whichever way you turn, verse 4, that Hashem may establish his word which he spoke concerning me, 
this is David, saying, if your children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail you, a man on the throne of Israel. It, it, it's, but the, the most powerful part is that there is, he says, be a man. Be a man. And the reason why I brought that up is because this is basically very much what Yaakov is saying to his sons when he calls them together which we're going to see very soon in this Parsha of Vayechi, because he calls them all together, and he basically calls them all together, and he speaks to them individually, but he has them all together in one place, so they're all hearing what he's saying to each one of them. And in essence, even though um, I like to call these, like <laughs> people call them blessings, but if you read some of them, they don't sound so much like blessings, like right, in blessing right. the sons. You know, they sound like curses embedded in blessings and blessings embedded in curses. It's, you know, kind of interesting. But in a roundabout way, I think he's saying the same thing as David as, as David Amelech was saying to Shlomo. He was saying, you know what, at the end of the day, be a mensch, be a man. And this is this is what I'm trying to bring out to us today in a very practical way, is saying that in all these things, all of the things that we've gone through, all of the trials that we've gone through, all of the testings that we've gone through, all of these things that we've gone through, we can choose to follow Hashem and to be a man or to be a woman, okay? And when it says to be a man, it's, it's, it's not excluding the women. It's talking about character. Right. It's talking about character. And, and you have a choice to be a person of character here. And this is what David and Melech is saying to Shlomo in the same way that Yaakov is getting ready to talk to his sons as, as well. You know, there's something else that I'm thinking about, too, as you're explaining all this. There's um, each, each day we all have opportunities to um, to take situations that, that we're engaged in and view them in different ways. You know, uh, there was uh, one one situation where somebody had been parking out in parking out in the street uh, who usually parked in the driveway. And uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, and there was uh, a thought that came up, a legitimate uh, thought that came up saying, well, I wonder what this guy is doing. He used to park in the driveway. And ever since he noticed that we had more vehicles here, um, all of a sudden he started parking in the street, which makes it really difficult for us. Is he being rude? And of course I drive a truck and I was thinking, well, I said on the other side of the coin, uh, that's a very long wheelbase truck and he has a hard time turning it, getting it into the driveway. Maybe because there's so many cars in the driveway is why he's parking in the street. So, you know, our perspective on things will truly change the way we view things and the way we, way we respond. Um, so when always taking the higher road and giving someone the benefit of the doubt uh, is it should always be our first choice. And of course, unless it's in a life or death situation where we know better, but I mean, in, in general, you know, as a general rule of thumb, and this is something that we have an opportunity to employ on a daily basis. And the more we do this, you know, the stronger, you know, our armor will get and we will just, it'll, it'll improve our character as well, I think. All right. And what you're bringing up is, is a very powerful concept in Judaism, in what we learn in Judaism called Dan Lakaf Sechut. Um, it's the concept of judging favorably or giving the benefit of the doubt. Um, it, because we as people, as human beings, have this, um, this capacity to continuously build scenarios in our head of what we think things are as opposed to what they actually are right meaning just like you said you don't know what that situation is you never know um what it is and it really becomes how you choose to view something um it, it's all about perspective um if you watch closely enough the world rather than jumping to conclusions you'll find very quickly that typically what you think is reality um, is not, and it's just the opposite. And, and people are not out to get you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and people really are. There are a lot more stories of um, um, really good people in the world than there are bad, you know, even in the midst of all the, the things that were going on uh, that are going on here today. You know, I live in a community it, 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 we're, we're a relatively small city 
compared to the major cities in Israel. There are only 32,000 people in Sfat. Um, and while we have a very, probably a smaller percentage of Arabic population um, of most cities, um, the truth of the matter is, is that many of the shopkeepers in, in Sfat are Arabic and they're wonderful people, wonderful people. And all they want to do is live their lives. All they want to do is raise their kids in peace. All they want to do is see their kids get a good education. All they want to see is their kids uh, be successful. No different than the Jewish mothers and fathers in Sfat as well. But it's all perspective. Right, sure. You can walk sure around and you, you can think that every person that's an Arab um, is terrible. Or, or you can give people the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean not to be careful. Um, we should always be in our guard. And certainly in this country, that's something that we have to do on a regular basis. Um, but at the same time, we have an opportunity to take each case as an individual case and see how we interact with people rather than just, um, you know, projecting onto other people. Couldn't be said any better. Yeah. So, um, so we move on and, and it, and it now talks about in the next few verses, the time drew near that, you know, that Israel must die. And here we see him being called Israel as opposed to Yaakov. And oftentimes what we see is that Chazal, the sages will teach that Israel was a more elevated name given to Yaakov, that when it describes him as Yaakov, it's, it's a less elevated name as opposed to Yisrael, which is a much more elevated name. Uh, and he calls his son Yosef and says to him, if I found favor in your sight, I pray thee put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and true with me, bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. So we have this whole thing going back and forth and this idea of um, Yaakov not wanting to be buried in um, Mitzrayim in Egypt. There's a lot of different thoughts on this. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time in it, um, but there is some, some of the commentaries speak about this really having to do with the fact that uh, burial was totally different in Egypt. Um, and with Yosef being a very elevated um, person, being a ruler there, um, it had, and Yaakov being his father, would have been considered an elevated individual as well. And the Egyptians would have wanted to honor him by, by burying him in, in their, um, um, the, the way they practice, mm -hmm. which would have been in a coffin as opposed to in the ground, you know, according to Jewish burial. Um, so he was, he was really, um, it wasn't just the idea of wanting to be buried in Canaan or in Eretz Yisrael, but it was this idea of not being buried according to the custom of the Egyptians as well. We see this, um, as well when he, um, when Yosef brings, um, Ephraim, Ephraim and Manasseh to his father as well. And one of the things that we see and I'm just kind of going through this fast because there, there is uh, a part of the part that I, I really want to get into, the meat of, that I think is very important. And I know we have limited time. so. Okay. Uh, but one of the things that Yaakov says when the boys are brought before him is, who are these? Who are these? And... That's an interesting thing for a uh, grandfather to say. Who are these? Sure. No, he, he didn't. Uh, you know, we, we don't. Now, he had lived there 17 years, right? Um, so we don't know what kind of interaction. Are we to believe that, uh, that at some point, uh, you know, he, he had not seen them for 17 years? Um, uh, uh, so when. You know what? I was curious about something, too is that, um, in fact, at reading this Parsha is what actually spurred on a question. And that question is, uh, you know, in Judaism, they, they base their, uh, their Judaism based on the mother, not the father. And so I'm wondering, is does this have some connection there? Where he's a, who's whose are these, right? So would he really want to know? I mean, uh, maybe he didn't know, or maybe he, did, he was trying to get him to clarify, but was he possibly asking him, uh, who's their mother? Uh, is, he, is she a Jewish woman or, you know, is she an Egyptian? Is that a possibility? It's one of the possible things, but really what it has to do with it, it has to do with custom as well, because they would have been dressed totally differently. Mm. Uh, 
In other words, they would have been dressed as, as Egyptian royalty, the way Yosef would have been dressed. It, it's very interesting because when you see also when, uh, when Yosef takes Yaakov, you know, and they take the body back to Canaan, to Eretz Yisrael, and they're mourning, um, the Hebrews look and say, who are they? What's going on with these Egyptians? Um, because basically Yosef was, was dressed as Egyptian royalty and all of his entourage, other than obviously his brothers who were not, you know, right. uh, who were not, uh, who had not um, kind of assimilated into that culture. So, so one of the main thoughts is that when he says, who are these? It's related to him seeing these two young boys dressed as Egyptian royalty. Um, and what the, what the sages say is that the way in which Yosef responds, he responds in a way letting him know that while they're dressed that way, they're definitely Jewish kids, um, you know, and I've kept them Jewish and taught them, you know, the right way in which to follow um, Hashem. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That's that makes sense. sense. Um, but where I want to go is I want to jump ahead to what I think is the meat, at least for me, because there's a lot going on out there today um, that um, – Well, let me just get get into this and we'll, we'll discuss it. So in chapter 49 and verse 1, um, it says, Vayikra Yaakov el bana vayomer he hasfu vaagida lachem et asher yikra edchem vaacharit hayamim. And then in the next verse it says, He kavtsu vishimu Bnei Yaakov v'shimu el Yisrael avichem. So we have two interesting words in these verses. You said chapter 49, was that it? 49 one? Yeah, it's 49 one. And okay, two. we're good, got it. Um, in the first verse, we have the word he asfu. And in the second verse, we have he kavsu. Okay? The roots of those words are asifa and kibbutz, kibbutz, like a kibbutz, okay? Asifa is the root of the Hebrew he, has, he asfu that I talked about, and kibbutz is the root of that word he kavtsu. And in, in a way that these words are synonymous, kibbutz is the specific term for gathering together that which is dispersed, okay? And asifa is a later stage of meaning bringing or gathering to a designated place. So typically you would see like kibbutz coming first because in order to bring something to a designated place, you first have to gather something that's dispersed. Hmm. Yet in our verses, we see it just the opposite. We see he asfu first and he kavtsu in the second verse. Um, so, so we try to figure out what this is. Um, and probably what I should have done was I should have either read it or had you read it so that, um, <laughs> cause I'm reading it in Hebrew and I'm just assuming that everybody knows what I'm talking okay, about. Okay. Let me, <laughs> that's so, so it says in 49, uh, let me see 49, one and two, it says now Yaakov called his sons and said, gather round. That's the word. Hey, asfu that I talked about, and gather that I may tell you that which will befall you in um, uh, the end days, so to speak, or after time of days. And then it says, come together and hearken, sons of Yaakov, or hearken, listen to Yaakov, listen to Israel, your father. This is very interesting, too, because it uses both his names in the mm -hmm. second verse. So that's interesting as well, because remember, I talked about it being an elevated name and a less elevated name. Right. The way the so King James uh, reads Genesis 49, 1, and Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the end uh, or in the last days. Gather right. yourselves together and hear, ye my sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, right. okay. So just gather both times. It, it, so that's why I'm saying it's right, honest. right. 
Okay? But they have different kinds of meanings, and you can understand why I say that one is gathering dispersed, and the other one is gathering to a place. So you would think that they should be the other way around. Mm. Expect that the dispersed would be brought together, and then they would be brought to a designated place. And yet Yaakov ju- uses everything uh, uh, opposite. So it's based on this that Chazal, the sages in Judaism, specifically in Bereshis Rabbah, in the Midrash 99.5, hint that it was really Yaakov's intention to speak to his sons about a time in the future. And this is why you'll often see it translated as the last days or in the end days. In other words, he's the hint is that he's going to speak to them about what we talked about at the beginning of the show, Geulah, the final redemption. This is why he commanded them to band together as a unified asifa. Hmm. Okay? Why? Because this is a spiritual unity that's higher than the physical, physical gathering together of kibbutz. Kibbutz is in the same way that Yaakov is a less elevated name and Yisrael is a more elevated name. Asifa is a more spiritual concept related to them gathering together, and kibbutz is the less spiritual um, concept here of these words. And this was really meant to prepare them for the gula, for the redemption. And this is something that's really relevant to us today as well. Because everything that I do and teach, along with others, like Rabbi Katz and Rabbi Skobach and Rabbi Singer and Rabbi Chaim Richman and so many of the people that are doing the work that we do in teaching Torah to the nations, is to usher in Geula and Moshiach. And it shouldn't just be the goal of people like us. It should be the goal of every person, everybody, every person that's listening, every person that loves Hashem, that wants to attach themselves to Hashem in the right way, um, that loves Hashem's Torah, that has left idolatry, it should be their goal to usher in Gula Mashiach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's something that stands in the way of that. And the sages allude to this as well, as it relates to Parshas Vayechi in the Talmud, in Yoma 9b. And this is what it reads. It says, but why was the second sanctuary destroyed? It's talking about the Beis Amigdash. Because the Beis Amigdash is part of Gula. The whole idea of having Beis Amigdash, of having the temple rebuilt, has to do with Gula and Mashiach. We know that one of the things that Mashiach will do is build the third temple. Right. right. Yoma 9b, it says, but why was the sanctuary destroyed? Seeing that in its time they were occupying themselves with Torah, precepts and the practice of charity. It's like they were doing these things. How come it was destroyed? Because therein prevailed what we call sinachanam, hatred without cause, that teaches you that groundless hatred is considered as even gravity with the three sins of idolatry, immorality, and bloodshed together. Meaning that that baseless, baseless hatred of one person for another, and this goes back to what we talked about, you know, um, benefit of the doubt, don la kaf sechut, judging favorably, everything, everything related to that, that you can do all those things. You can follow the Torah, you can follow the precepts, you can give tzedakah, you can do all those things. But my friends, if you're looking at another Jew or another non-Jew that loves Torah and you have a problem with them and, and you have hatred in your heart, God is saying that this is even as grave as all three sins of idolatry, immorality, and bloodshed. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, if we're to see the rebuilding of the temple, which is part of Gula, it requires the type of unity that Yaakov is referring to here. He's basically saying, if you will first unite in a spiritual way, in unity, gather together, my sons, then I can tell you what will happen in the end days. Okay? And then the Malbim that I brought up before, the Malbim brings another perspective on this concept of kibbutz and asifa. Okay? And, and he also brings it according to the Midrash, also in Breshish Rabbah, I think in Breshish Rabbah 98. And he says that Yaakov prophesied, hey, asfu, let the lost ten tribes be gathered in. He kavtsu, let the tribes of Judah and Benjamin be gathered in. And he bases this on, this, this midrash is based on the following verse 
from Yeshiahu from Isaiah. Um, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12, where it says, and he will set up an ensign for the nations and will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, there are some people that are listening to my words right now, William, and they're salivating <laughs> because they hear 10 tribes. And there are other people that are smacking their heads and going, oh, I can't believe he's going there. Okay. Um, I, there's a reason why I'm bringing this up. It's believed that the 10 tribes are lost. In other words, their whereabouts are unknown, while the Jews are simply dispersed. There's a difference. That's what I'm trying to bring up. When you talk about the 10 tribes being lost, actually it says in the verse in Hebrew, it says, V'yasaf nidche Yisrael in Yeshiahu 11, Basically, Nidche Yisrael means the, the lost of Israel um, or, or um, you know, as opposed to a dispersion like um, we see, it goes on to say, Un Futsot Yehuda Yikabetz. Yikabetz, we see, is that same root again, like we saw Kibbutz. Okay, so one is talking about dispersed and one is talking about lost. Huge difference between the two. One is where the the um, where the the tribes of Yehuda and Benjamin, the Jews, are dispersed to the four corners of the earth, but these ten tribes are lost. And the Malbim uses the end of the verse uh, 49:2, where it says, "And listen, O children of Yaakov, listen to Israel, your father." He says the words of He Asfu. And he kavtsu parallel Yaakov and Israel. Remember how I just said that? Mm -hmm. The one is an elevated name and one is a less elevated name. The same way he asfu and he kavtsu, one is elevated and one's not. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is such a hot topic today. And the reason why I want to bring it up because I think that there are many people out there that are doing a disservice to people. Now, there are people that if they could throw tomatoes at me right now, they would. And there are other people that would probably hug me if they could. But there's probably be more tomato throwers. <laughs> Why? Because there are so many people out there today that want identity. There are so many people out there today that left idolatry, and they're trying to find their way. And they think that somehow, because they love the Jewish people, they love Israel, they love Torah, they come back to Torah, that somehow they must be these lost 10 tribes. And can I say for sure that, no, you're not the lost 10 tribes? No, I can't say that. But what I can say is that there's a big difference between those two words that we talked about, dispersed and lost. Okay? Mm -hmm. some, but some things that, that's dispersed can be gathered back together again. Something that's lost is usually lost. This is not like we can click a clicker. And, you know, and, and suddenly we're going to find these people. So, so I want to discuss this because I think that there are many people that are doing the, a disservice to the people that I love. And the people that I love are people who I refer to as Ger, Gerim or Ger Noahide or however they want to describe themselves are people who love Hashem, who have left idolatry, who want to attach themselves to Hashem in the right way. And... And there are many people out there, even Jewish people like myself, Orthodox Jewish people myself, that I think are doing them a disservice. I just saw one the other day, and I got into it with him, and he got really upset with me and, you know, want, want, didn't want me to post on his thread anymore because he said, this is what he said. I'm not going to mention the guy's name, but this is what he said. He said, I wrote this last year, but it really came out and, and jumped out at me related to the portion this week. He said, especially since I just got back from... Um, hanging out with some of the descendants of Ephraim. And so I asked him a simple question on his thread. I said, if the Jewish people are only able to determine uh, if we're not Kohanim and we're not Levi'im, uh, none of us as Jews can determine what tribe we're from until Mashiach comes, how is it that you were able to hang out with the descendants of Ephraim? Interesting. And then he said to me, well, the people I'm referring to are not Jewish. And I'm like, wait a minute. So you're saying that the people who are descendants of Ephraim are not Jewish? When we see in the Torah portion <laughs> that Yosef brings his sons 
Ephraim and Manasseh before his father, and his father says, I'm taking them as my own, and they become part of the tribes of Israel, but you're saying they're not Jewish? Now, I know we're getting into a, a gray zone here with the 10 tribes, so I want to I wanna discuss this. I do have a question, um, too. While so. we still have time. Okay. There's a recorded dispute between two great sages in the Mishnah as to whether the 10 tribes are coming back. Now, obviously, you have me on the show. You know I'm an Orthodox Jew, so I'm going to bring the Jewish perspective, and I know in many ways you. this is what you're looking for. Right. And, and many people that listen are looking for that. The people that are not looking for that, I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, the people that are anti-rabbinic, that are anti um, Torah Shabal Peh, the oral Torah, that's for another show. Uh, I'm sure you've addressed that with some of the other teachers. You know, maybe I can address it at some point in the future on another show um, uh, because I think I can easily show people where they're wrong in this. But let's talk about these, let's talk about some of these disputes that go on. Rabbi Akiva, who's one of the great sages in Judaism, he believes that the 10 tribes will not return, and he bases this on Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 27, that says, And Hashem rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is to this day. And it says, Just as a day passes and will never return, so too they will be exiled never to return. The person who disagrees with him is Rabbi Eliezer, who's another great um, commentator that we see in the Talmud and the Gemara. And Rabbi Eliezer says, just like a day is followed by darkness and light later returns, so too, although it will become dark for the 10 tribes, God will ultimately take them out of their darkness. And this is from uh, in the Sanhedrin, uh, for people that want to look this up, Sanhedrin 110b. Okay, um, and this is what the Mishnah says there. It says the 10 tribes will not return. Um, oh, this is Rabbi Akiva, I believe. This is his view. It says the 10 tribes will not return for it is said and cast them into another land as it is this day, just as the day goes and does not return. This is Rabbi Akiva's view. Rabbi Eliezer said as this day, just as the day darkens, then become light again. So this is this is that Sanhedrin 110b. That's the Mishnah. Um, I just gave you a little piece of that. Okay. Now the Talmud goes on and gives a third opinion, uh, where it says Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda of the town of Akko says in the name of Rabbi Shimon, if their deeds are as this day, they will not return; otherwise, they shall. What's he saying there? So in short, we have three opinions. We have the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, who holds that the 10 tribes are not coming back. We have Rabbi Eliezer, who holds that they are. And we have Rabbi Shimon that says it depends on whether or not they repent. Um, but let's look at this view a little bit further. If we really analyze Rabbi Akiva, what he's saying, we have to look a little further to really give an explanation. Because it seems to contradict clear prophecy that we have in the Tanakh about the reunion of all of Israel. As a matter of fact, last week's Haftorah from Ezekiel 37 talks about this, where the prophet Ezekiel describes the ultimate reunion between the ten tribes of the tribe of Judah. Okay, it says, Say to them, So says Hashem, your God, Behold, I will take the stick of Yosef, which is, a hand, is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will place them with him, with the stick of Judah, and I will make them into one stick, and they shall become one in my hand, and the sticks upon which you still write shall be in your hand before their eyes, and say to them, so says Hashem, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side, and I will bring them to their land, and I will make them into one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be to them all as a king, and they shall no longer be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore. Pretty clear. So how does Rabbi Akiva say that, you know, they're not going to come back? Um, so one of the commentators, Rabbi Yosef Albo, who lived in the um, late 14th into the 15th century, 
he attempts to reconcile these prophecies from Yechezkiel, from Ezekiel, with Rabbi Akiva's opinion by explaining that Rabbi Akiva was of the view that the prophecies had already been fulfilled during the era of the Second Holy Temple in Yerushalayim. But this is problematic in light of the fact that in the Midrash, Rabbi Akiva himself compares the exile of the ten tribes of Israel to that of a widow, which implies that they are gone and not will return. In other words, a widow is a widow. You know, her, her husband's not going to return. So the question we ask to, have to ask is, did they already return? So while many have the idea that all the Jews are now descendants of only two and a half tribes, the truth is that when the ten tribes were captured and sent into exile, a tenth of their population remained. That not everybody went into exile. Because uh, the prophet Amos, Amos, says, For so said Hashem, the city that gives forth a thousand shall remain with a hundred, and the one that gives forth a hundred shall remain with ten of the house of Israel. This is from Amos 5.3. Okay? Additionally, there's another account of the return of some of the ten tribes during the days of King Yoshia, uh, Josiah, because he undertook to restore the Holy Temple, which had been neglected for a long time. And while this restoration was taking place, under the, the supervision of the Kohen HaGadol, Hilkiah, an ancient Torah scroll from the time of Moshe was found. And this unique Torah scroll had been kept in the Holy of Holies in the temple. But in the, but in the time of the idol-worshipping kings, an upright priest removed it from there and hid it in a secret place in the temple. Uh, when the Torah scroll was opened and read, it opened to the section in, in Devarim and Deuteronomy containing an admonition where God warns the Jewish people of the terrible consequences of neglecting the Torah and the commandments leading to destruction and exile. We see that, I believe, in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. And so the king, deeply shaken and heartbroken, tore his clothes and ordered Hilkiah and four other royal messengers to go to the prophets to inquire as to what should be done in view of the divine warning that had just been received. Who do they go to? They go to the prophetess Huldah who then prophesied about the impending doom of exile. Now that's interesting. Why did they go to the prophet, prophetess Huldah when Yirmiyahu, the prophet Jeremiah, was the prophet of that day? Why didn't they go to Jeremiah? And the Talmud notes this. The Talmud says under normal circumstances, the king should have sent for Yirmiyahu, who was the leading prophet of the day. However, there's something interesting that we read in the Talmud, both in Megillah 14b and in Erchin 33a, where it says that Yirmiyahu Jeremiah was on a divine mission to the ten tribes, and in fact, he actually gathered them up and returned them to Israel, where Josiah ruled over them. And this is what it says, and I'm going to read you from Megillah 14b. I'm not going to read Erchin 33a because it basically says the same thing. It says, Holda, as it is written, so Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Achbor, etc. But if Jeremiah was there, how could she prophesy? It was said in the school of Rav, in the name of Rav, Hulda was a near relative of, of Yirmiyahu, of Jeremiah, and he did not object to her doing so. But how could Josiah himself pass over Jeremiah and send to her? The members of the school of Rav Shila replied, because women are tender-hearted. However, Rav Yochanan said, Yirmiyahu was not there as he had gone to bring back the ten tribes whence we know that they returned, because it is written, for the seller shall not return to that which is sold. Now, is it possible that after the jubilee had ceased, the prophet should prophesy that it will cease? The fact is that it teaches that Jeremiah brought them back and Josiah, the son of Ammon, ruled over them. This is from Megillah 14. So, this, however, does not mean that the prophet Jeremiah returned all of the exiles. Rather, he gathered only some of the people of the ten tribes who had managed to escape while being led into exile. Then they joined the rest of the Jewish nation and are included in their history. So in light of the above, we can better understand that Rabbi Akiva's view that the ten tribes will not return 
for what it, he means to say is that all those who are meant to return have already done so, that the rest are lost forever having intermingled with other nations. And this is something that I bring up all the time, not to be mean and, and to elevate Jews above other people, but the truth of the matter is, is that I'm the one that says all the time that the Torah is not about the Jews. The Torah is about the nations. Hashem gave the Jewish people a, a mission. He said, be a, or goyim, be a light to the nations. Uh, be the ones that go out and teach the nations the right way. The truth is that God doesn't make mistakes. God didn't make everybody Jewish. Uh, God made nations. Yes, there was a dispersion. Yes, there was an exile. Um, yes, some of them came back, many of them came back, and the others were lost and have intermingled with the nations. What we are left with then is a disagreement as to whether the rest of the lost tribes, those who have not returned, will ever return and be reunited with the rest of the Jewish nation. Rambam discusses this with regards to this dispute between Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Eliezer as to whether the lost tribes will ever return that when there is a dispute in the Talmud that has no actionable relevance to us, Jewish law does not rule either way. Okay? Hmm. However, there are those who do rule and say that we follow Rabbi Eliezer's opinion that the ten tribes will ultimately be reunited with the rest of Israel, but when? At the time of Gula, at the time of redemption, with the coming of Mashiach. Interesting. Okay? So... The point that I'm trying to bring out in all of this is that you should be satisfied with who Hashem made you. You should be satisfied with the idea that Hashem made a way for the righteous of the nations to come into relationship with him that doesn't require one to be Jewish to do it. You don't have to be one of the ten lost tribes. Just because you love Israel, just because you came out of idolatry, just because you came to Torah, just because you feel like you have a Jewish neshama, does not mean that you're part of the lost 10 tribes. We don't know who those people are. I don't even know what tribe I'm from. I'm not going to know what tribe I'm from until Mashiach comes. Somebody said to me the other day, well, I fasted and prayed and God showed me what tribe I'm from. Hmm. I don't want to say anything, but that sounds very Christian. Right. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I don't need Hashem to tell me what tribe I'm from. I'm very satisfied being who I am. If God wants to show me when there's a redemption, when we all come together, what my portion is, what part of Israel I'm supposed to live in, if it's not supposed to be spot, I'll move to that place. But right now I'm, I'm satisfied with who I am. Yep, same here. Yep. I mean, it, it would be interesting to find out, but um, like you said, there's really, there's really not a specific way of knowing uh, but even still, I think that's the thing that brought me and my wife the most comfort is knowing that it, where we're at is okay. That's 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 the bottom line. Where we are is okay. I mean, if we feel compelled to convert to Judaism, then by all means, go for it. Um, you know, we do, but I mean, there's people out there who don't, and it's okay. You don't have to convert to Judaism to be in a right relationship with Hashem, like you mentioned before, and so many of the teachers have confirmed. So, um, well. I, re I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for uh, for hanging out with us again, as usual. Uh, I'm going to get you in here uh, as often as I can. I will see if we can squeeze out a uh, uh, an alternate teaching on a different time slot, if I can get you to wake at a, at a nice awake time, that is. <laughs> I know. We didn't get through a lot of it. We, we have a lot more that we could have done. Um, but, uh, we got to. What, what we say at the end of a book is Chazak, Chazak, Beneath Chazak. I mean, and you know, that's interesting. You said it because we don't, uh, pretty much on every week, we only do like an hour show and we never make it through. <laughs> so, I guess you could say realistically, this is more like the teaser. This is more like the teaser show to get you to want to go and read the rest of it. So, very good. Well, Ira, it's been a pleasure. Everybody, it's good to see you all again. Uh, meet us here again tonight, 9.30 with Rabbi Michael Spilvak. Two weeks coming up, Rabbi Eli Cohen and Rabbi Mendel Kaplan from Chabad.org for your next two weeks of Tour Talk. About eight weeks away for another episode of Tour Talk with Ira Michelson. So until then, everybody, we'll see you next time. Shalom, shalom. Thank you.